Council online, HPG connection online, educational module online, all systems nominal. Hello, class, and welcome to On the Origin of Battlemix podcast, episode 95, The Spider. I'm your host, Brent Stewart. My co-hosts today are... I'm Shamway. And I'm Derek. And today we are talking about The Spider, a 30-ton scout mech that has a long pedigree and uh, a great history on the battlefield. You've probably played with it or against it if you've played any of the video games. Yeah blown up so many spiders the spider is a an oft destroyed mech if you play hbs they appear they're annoying and then they die goss rifle solves all problems yes <laughs> especially if it's something spider sized i mean that yeah the, the gauss rifle solves basically every problem i mean the spider was involved in one of my favorite moments that i've had in um advanced 3062 had a fafnir twin heavy goss fire when you used to be able to do called shot, hit the thing center torso, one blows blows it up, the other one goes through it, hits the mech behind it, and head caps it. <laughs> nice. It was perfect. So the spider was produced by Newhart Interstellar in the year 2650 for the Star League, with the emphasis on special operations units. Its speed and communication system are what make it a machine that has endured. While Newhart Interstellar secured a coveted SLDF contract, they struggled to produce any significant number, but they were able to produce significant amounts of parts to supply the unit's requisitioned spiders, keeping the machine operational and on the battlefield. When the factory on New Earth was destroyed during the last days of the Amara Civil War, the spider came the closest it ever did to extinction. But while parts became rare, like the catapult, having military operations undertaken to secure replacement parts to keep a house unit operational during the very dark days of the succession wars, during the dividing of the Terran hegemony, the Free World League was able to secure a complete set of technical specifications for the spider. They used these in a deal with Nimakchi Fusion Productions Limited to develop a locally produced spider manufacturing line, with the stipulation that Nimakachi gained exclusive rights to the spider design. As time passed, Nimakachi would begin exporting the spider to the Draconis Combine and then opening a limited production facility in Draconis Combine space, eventually producing exclusive Draconis Combine models. As the sole producer of the Spider for the Succession Wars, the majority of them traditionally are seen in the Free World League Militia and the Draconis Combine Mustard Soldiery. But with the foundation of the Republic of the Sphere and the deal with Prup Armaments Works to reverse engineer a field refit into the SDR-8R, the Republic of the Sphere now has a supply of Spiders. If limited as legal issues resulted in late deliveries and production slowing, but what of the future of the spider? It is seen most places in some model. Many models lack an ejection system, traditionally have a energy at loadout. It has a superb integrated communication system. Its speed is its armor and jumps with ease and grace. It is a hallmark of a scout lance and is common to see in any era. And I don't expect it to go away anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, when you think of your prototypical scout mech, a lot of people, you know, top five people mention the spider is in there. It, it's lightly armored, lightly armed, moves real fast, and it can get out of situations it's not supposed to be in. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. And if it doesn't, you know, I mean, you, it's not going to be able to re report that it didn't get out of the situation. So statistically, it's great. There you go. So it's got the design quirks of easy to maintain, nimble jumper, and no ejection system. Yeah, I noticed that one when I was glancing at that. That's uh, <laughs> I'm sure that inspired lots of confidence in Spider Mech Warriors in the, over the years, mm -hmm. especially being in something that has less armor than like a 20 ton mech at some points. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it does go fast. That that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Speed is basically its only defense. Otherwise, you're you're essentially wearing a t-shirt against things that have very large guns. I mean, even medium lasers are scary to this thing. Yeah. I mean, when your center torso armor is eight, you know you're, ha you're going to have a bad time. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a bad time. So our first model seen in 2650, and it is the SDR-5V, and it's got a movement profile of 8128. It's got two medium lasers in the center torso, and it's got 
10 single heat sinks and uh, no weight savings but as we said pretty light armor but it's got a jump of eight which is of course high enough uh, that it hits that magic number where you're giving a a worse number to your opponent than you're taking yeah i mean if you desperately need something to go and deal with like extremely light raiders like someone who's in a toyota helix with just a machine gun this will do great Mm -hmm. it'll catch them it'll blow them up with those medium lasers and it'll jump away but but it, it it's not recommended against uh most other light max no as soon as it hits anything that has a medium laser or bigger you're gonna have a bad time mm -hmm. yeah even even fellow 30 tonners unless you have like the element of surprise yeah yeah and you're backed up by others. I, I mean, I don't see a spider operating by itself because it's just, it, it just can't. It has to have friends. Yeah, no, it's definitely part of a light lance. And it's not a light lance that engages. It's a scout lance that runs away. Yeah. Yep. So it's got a battle value of 622 and a point value of 21. It is followed up by the 5k in 2850. So the 5k has that movement profile of 8126. So it drops some jump jets and uh, as such makes the, uh, the movement profile not quite as good. It's got a medium laser in the center torso. It's got a machine gun in the right arm and a machine gun in the left arm. It's got 10 single heat sinks. It doesn't have any energy savings, and it has a ton of ammo in the center torso. Doesn't have any more armor. Yeah, I... not a fan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it does very well at its intended purpose of anti-infantry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, like, you're gonna have a bad time. And the center torso for the ammo, like, logically, it's a good spot. Just because there's so much armor there, but game wise, it isn't. <laughs> it's a terrible spot. Yeah, that goes up. That that machine gun ammo is uh, surprisingly deadly. Yeah, and realistically, like, let it's so lightly armored that if something hits it real hard, it's dead no matter what. Yeah, yeah. So like, it's it's a pedantic gripe. I'm aware. Getting rid of two of the jump jets for that ton of ammo, though, is just brutal. It hurts. It hurts. It, with something that was depending on them, it just doesn't bode well. I think with this, you could probably say it's like an anti-partisan mech, mm -hmm. like used against insurgents, like people that are going to be lightly armed using, you know, small arms. And The biggest thing yeah. you have to really worry about is like a heavy machine gun or maybe an RPG or two, you know? Yeah, some SRMs, maybe like an IED, but like otherwise... I mean, it is also Succession Ward, so it makes sense that it's not quite as good. Yeah, but, I, I mean, just its role. <laughs> it's not... I don't think I'd put this thing on the battlefield against other mechs. It just seems suicidal. But yeah. it's also Karita, so, you know, logic doesn't necessarily uh, play effects there. They have their own special logic. Yeah, Bushido. Uh, so it's got a battle value of 503 and a point value of 21. We then come to the 5D, D for Davian. This guy's got a movement profile of 8128, so gets those uh, jump jets and keeps that nice movement profile. It's got a medium laser in the center torso, a flamer in the right arm, and then it has 10 single heat sinks and no weight saving and no armor upgrade, really. So uh, it's just the, the Davian model in 2853, so still Succession Wars. It just different flavor slash technically it's a retrofit because the Davians don't have a production line. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. It does a, I, I argue, it does a better job of anti-infantry than uh, the Greaton <laughs> version just because, yeah, it might not be as effective at ranged killing of infantry, but no infantryman's going to sit around and let himself get burned to death. And then you also don't explode from a machine gun ammo. True. I mean, I do like the jump eight. Yeah, <laughs> yes. it, it does go back to the jump eight. Fear is a weapon all of its own. Fear, fear is a weapon True. all of its own. And then it also has the very niche application of anti-vehicle yeah. with that flamer. It could get up nice and close and just toast them. Yeah, that and flamer which... makes it very strong against both infantry and vehicles because, uh, yeah. So your Toyota Helix from the periphery is now uh, a charred corpse up of Toyota Helix from the periphery. One might say fear <laughs> is the mind killer. Yes. 
Fear is also the vehicle killer. Your, your helix is now terrain for the next battle. Congratulations. So it's got a battle value of 524 and a point value of 21. Before we move on to the next model, why don't we have a quick discussion about the art, which is uh, spindly. It's uh, <laughs> These last three models have that weird kind of like, they're not quite wings and they're not quite like afterburner rocket pack like yeah they look almost like partial wings but they're not quite and it's got like almost bird feet but human arms and it's got that really weird torso that almost looks like a spider torso a little bit so you can see where it came from yeah i think those like fins that it has are more like protective from the jump jets yeah Yeah. if i remember correctly from the plastic one that you could get before the kickstarter it's uh the whole jump jet assembly is attached to those Mm -hmm. that would make sense it has the entire jump pack on the back, and it looks like the fins are more of just, like, protective of, like, the limbs and the head. Yeah, C- the CGL uh, jump pack fins definitely gives them much more of a reason to exist. They're, like, protection and then maybe a little bit of directionality if needed. Yeah. Whereas the old one's just a little weird. Yeah, the two art pieces that are available for the spider, for the 5D, or for the 5 series are kind of interesting. I really like the 7 series art. But it's also got, like, a solid, like, head assembly, so, like, I I get why it has no ejection system, but it should have a full head ejection system. I'm kind of surprised that's not something that came around, because it seems like something you could easily retrofit onto this design. Absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah, obviously the first runs weren't going to have it, just because that's something that would require a full factory refit, but... Once you start producing them again and upgrade the design with... Yeah, later generations of it you think would have it. That At that point, you'd be starting to you know, be able to slot stuff on there. That's new. Because you're already going in there anyway to fix it. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, no, the, the old art is definitely unique and kind of special. And uh, I don't think it's bad, but it's definitely not my favorite. <laughs> we'll put it that yeah. way. It's aight. Yeah, that's, that's a fair uh, description of it. It's certainly not the worst of the old art. No. No. So next up, we have the 7M, seen in 3051. So a bit of a time jump again. You know, first uh, time jump was 200 years between the first and second model, and then uh, another 200. So, you know, in 100 years from where we are now, we'll have another model, right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But this guy's got a movement profile of 8128. It's got two medium pulse lasers in the center torso. It's got 10 single heat sinks. It's got ferro armor for weight savings and endo steel. And it has uh, not really any more armor, so... No, you actually drop a little bit. You drop three points, which isn't a lot, but it's still something. But you also gain firepower. You gain yeah. a lot of firepower. You drop one from the center rear and one from each leg? Yeah. So yeah. It's not like you're losing a ton by any means, but... No. When you have such a little amount of armor, every point counts at that point. But you also gain two medium pulse lasers, so... Yes. <laughs> I think the trade was worth it, but... Yeah. Also can get toasty, though. Yeah, you know, toasty. You know, this means you don't have to cook your lunch. Yeah. does get some new art, which is very similar to the older art. Uh, I really like it. Fixes the ankles, because the older ones kind of had like a, a double ankle-looking sort of thing, I think. At least from the angle I have on my record sheet, this one has a more standard one, but with a two-toed foot. I, you only see one of the fins on uh, this angle, but I'm assuming the, it has the other ones kind of like just shooting straight out its back. But uh, it's clearly jumping and moving, which is a good action pose for it. Very dynamic. I really like the Hermes and the Raven in the background. <laughs> the little the little line art doodles of them. They're so adorable. No. Yes, they are. They're cute. Look They're at them. adorable. Look at them. You will think they are adorable. <laughs> and before they murder you. And as they protect that, you know, orbital gun relay or whatever the heck it is. Mm-hmm. Of course, that's from the uh, the TRO. Yes, TRO 3050 upgrade. Mm-hmm. It's too bad it's not on the record sheet because they are super cute. <laughs> Some of the, like, background art is really good on the on the TROs, and it's a shame they don't put it on the record sheets. But I get why, because it would get... It's a lot of space. It would get busy very quickly. <laughs> yeah, that's your that's your problem right there. Mm-hmm. So the 7M has a battle value of 621 and a point value of 26. It was followed up by the SDR-C, so not the Clan C, 
but the dash C in 1354. And it's got a movement profile of 8128. It's got a medium laser in the center torso. It's got a medium pulse laser in the center torso. And it's got a C3 slave in the right torso. It's got ferro and endo and 10 single heat sinks. And I like it, I think, as a C3 unit this is amazing yeah i'm uh i'm that's i was about to say like that c3 right there perfect machine to put c3 on yeah Mm -hmm. honestly this thing like in a fire support lance or uh or supporting a heavy like c3 network it's it's so cheap it's like oh go forth (laughs) go forth little minion and get us uh fire and get us firing coordinates I could see this uh, and as part of a decently uh, industrialized world's militia. You know, like, this is one of the two mechs they have or something like that. And the other one's the C3 Master and everything else is LRM carriers with C3. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I could definitely see this in some of the higher tier units like Sword of Light. I know it's available for the Davians, so like Davian mm-hmm. guards, some of their like A tier units. Especially yeah. because a lot of them end up getting a lot of C3. And it's just like, go forth, little minion. Find our targets so we might obliterate them with our firepower. Yeah, and it's nice that it has a little bit more gotten as well. Like, even though it does downgrade the medium pulse to a standard medium laser, it's still nice to have because that's just, you know, it's enough damage to where you could be a threat if need be. Yeah, but the trade off of that C3, the lasers are great. I think it's the C3 putting it on there that makes it the most deadly. Is just what it can do with that and that alone. Oh, yeah. You can't defeat us. I know, but he can. <laughs> Whoosh in the distance. I would downgrade uh, the other pulse to a medium laser and then uh, just add some more armor personally. Cause... Yeah. But that's me. Yeah. I mean, I could see that. But I think I think overall this is this definitely... One of the best we've seen so far. <laughs> yeah. It's the best we've seen so far. It has... I mean, two lasers that make it fairly, you know, fairly effective at doing something. Mm -hmm. Then you have that C3 slave. That alone is, as I said, an extremely deadly weapon. Yeah. A well-placed C3 uh, slave with targeting on it is gonna gonna make people very, very sad. Yes. Yeah, that, like, at the very least, a threat of activation makes a player or an opponent have to... uh play much more defensively from like basically the get-go this is real good and it's got a battle value of 616 and a point value of 28 then in 3060 we have the 8m it's got that movement profile of 8128 it's got two medium pulse lasers in the center torso it's got 10 double heat sinks it's got pharaoh it's got endo it's just you know like the lost tech upgrade standardization of the the spider it real good as yeah. a entry level unit in that era yeah all, all it does is just give it the 7m double heat sinks mm-hmm. which and two pulse lasers double heat sinks that's nice yeah it's mm-hmm. nice it solves all of its heat issues in one go yeah yep. which is not bad it's basically a very nice introductory mech on on pulse lasers and double heat sinks and jumping and jumping, yep. Yump. We might be down on some of these, but all of these except for one have that, you know, jump profile where they can hand out worse numbers than they take, which is good. Yeah. This thing can get in and out of anywhere it needs to go. I mean, I, I would say for the spider, I know we're halfway through, but like overall from just the models we've looked at, it's like you said, it's not where like down, we might seem down on it. It's just, it's it's all right it's not special it's yeah it it does what it does it's just i think its role is very limited battlefield wise it's just a scout it's not like an ambush mech like some of the other lights that we've you know looked at and seen Mm -hmm. it's just a scout that's all it really does it scouts and it scouts things it scouts and it scouts things yep i mean also it's like super over representation in the video games probably didn't help oh no I'm just so used to like looking at them and just point click fire uh, fire ultra ten and make it go away and then move on with my life. <laughs> Shows up in my salvage and I just ignore it. <laughs> you killed my father. For me, it was a Tuesday. Yep. 
So the 8M has a battle value of 621 and a point value of 26. We then come to the 7K. And uh, this has some different art, which is... Uh, I, I like it. It's, it's <laughs> kind of goofy and great. <laughs> it's got a movement profile of 8128. It's got two medium pulse lasers in the center torso. It's got the double heat sinks. It's got the pharaoh. It's got the endo, it's got the light fusion engine, and uh, because of that, it's got one double heatsink outside of the engine. Everything else has been internal. It would still be uh, the same as with a standard engine. Wait, does this have more armor on it? It does, slightly. It uses all of its weight savings from the light engine to get more armor. Ah, nice. I mean, it's essentially a, an 8M with more armor. Yeah. One could say that Krita knows how to build a spider. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Can't fault them on that. Oh. Huh. All right. Well, according to Mega Mech, one has to be external and it's in the right arm. Yeah. So take from that what you will of my record sheet. Go go off your personal record sheet, I guess, that you got in front of you that you're using. Oh, no. Yeah. It, the engine size would dictate whether it's a, uh, has an external, uh, engine heat sink or not. Not whether it's a light or, or light or extra light. Yeah, uh, but the, my record sheet has it listed in the left torso. It's the point yeah. I'm making. So yeah, add some more armor, which is good. I'm not going to complain about that. Nope. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty simple, just slight redesign. They just give it a 240 light. Boom, yeah. done. I do like the art redesign. It now has like a pair of wings over top of a very clear like output of jump jets on the center torso or behind the center of mass. Like it's got a very clear press button then go direction away from this you know <laughs> <laughs> the head redesign makes it look more like a fighter jet the arms are beefed up to have also kind of this like arm guard thing so it looks a little more brawly the legs have been redesigned to be kind of more gauntlety and i think those look quite good it went and had leg and arm day yeah, yeah. i also like its shoulder pads yeah i i think this is probably one of the uh, one of the better arts for it out of the three that we've looked at. Mm -hmm. So it's got a battle value of uh, 752 and a point value of 27, and it was seen in uh, 3067. And one year later in 3068, the 7K2 was seen. It's got a movement profile of 8127. It's got a ER large laser in the center torso. It's got 10 double heat sinks. It's got endo steel. It's got ferro. It's got a light fusion engine, so, you know, the 7K just rip everything out and put in an ER laser, or ER large laser, and uh, take out a jump jet. Yeah, and a little bit of armor. Yeah, also a little bit of armor. So, I mean, like, the, the longer reach is nice, but uh, it, I don't know. I like it. It's not bad. I mean, it's kind of like a annoying sniper. It's really all it is. Yeah. yeah. Fast-moving, annoying sniper. Like, it's more of a harasser than anything else now. Yeah, I mean, just you'd, you'd have to have a really good pilot in there to... Uh, Take advantage of it. To make sure you're hit, actually hitting anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, overall, though, not bad. It's just, I think it'd be more of an annoyance than anything else, because this thing's sitting on a hill, watching you come up a valley and just fires an ER, like, large laser that just hits something and causes annoyance. But I think in a lance, in an ambush lance, not a bad mech to have. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, like, this would be fantastic for harassing supply lines. Yeah, especially unarmored supply vehicles. Just <laughs> obliterate them. At yeah, range. so, like, from a, like, traditional, you know, large engagement, real good, very, very, very good. And, you know, it came out during the Jihad where, you know, that stuff was getting disrupted all the time. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just kind of needed something that could fill that role. And the spider was there. Mm -hmm. And I mean, overall, the spider is mostly completely energy based, so it's very good and not, you know, supply chain reliant, except for armor and replacement parts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the 2K's got a battle value of 884 and a point value of 23. So for our pilot profiles, we're going to start off with Lieutenant Gwendolyn Schnickord. Or Snickor? I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Uh, Snedicor? Uh, Snedicor. Yeah. Snidey. 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 Well, I was thrown over to Derek anyway, so here we go. Derek, take us away. <laughs> We're going to shorten it down because I'm just not going to try. 
Lieutenant Snidey <laughs> uh, recently promoted to command of a strike lance in the 154th Dark Horse Regiment of the Eridani Light Horse. Uh, Gwendolyn ha- showed a talent for reconnaissance and raiding, but was still uh, new to issuing commands. Suffering from a severe arachnophobia, it w- she found it ironic that she had been assigned to a spider, and that for the light horse she was at the forefront of their run-ins with the uh, the Black Widow herself, Natasha Kerensky. Mm-hmm. For a woman with uh, severe arachnophobia, she seems to attract a lot of arachnids. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Arachnophobia and pilots of spider. What kind of cruel <laughs> command structure is this? I don't know. Either that or it's really poor luck. I don't know. All of the above. All of the above. For our next one, we have Amir Decker Kowalski. Decker is a citizen of the Capellan Confederation. As soon as he qualified for the academy, his parents sent him off and he graduated with good marks. He was assigned to a dropship and then a few years later was transferred over to MechWarrior Training, a position that suited him well and uh, much better for his temperament. After completing his required service, he took his skills and applied them to the mercenary market, eventually joining an important mercenary unit that was influential in the Arano Restoration. He had the motto, any battle you can walk away from is a victory. His ultimate fate is unknown as we have conflicting reports of how, when, and where he died. Certainly not behind the wheels of a spider, and certainly not from an errant shot that just smacked right into the center of its face. Certainly not. Or thinking you had one more turn before a dropship lands? Yes. (sighs) Poor Decker. Alright, well, next up, we have Captain Rhonda Stilson, who is part of the Addix Dronus, uh, Draconis March Militia, so part of the Federated Sons, and she was in charge of a recon company. She is known as a force to be reckoned with on the Combine border for over two decades as a spider pilot, with a spider that is bright red and with gold highlights, which sounds very Korean and not very, uh, not very Fed Sun, but that's probably why it's recognizable. Uh, the March Militia is largely like red. Oh, like, okay. that's, that's the thing. It's really funny that uh, the people that hate Korea the most also use the same kind of color schemes. Yeah. What are we going to do, boss, to make the Cretans even angrier? We're going to use their paint scheme. That's what we're going to do. Well, I mean, also keeps on uh, costs for salvage when you don't have to repaint it all. Yeah. But Rhonda Stilson will not hesitate to engage units twice her mech's mass. So that's a 60-ton mech right there. Uh, using the mobility of the spider for hit-and-run tactics. If it's a rifleman, you know, she just needs to get in right behind it and you're good to go. Yeah. yeah. With some some uh, some of those mechs, she's going to tear them limb from limb. Yeah. With terrifying amounts of ease. Of course, due to her skills, she is on the short list for promotion to a major, but uh, this has only curtailed her ferocity slightly. Luckily for her, her company has kept her on top of her enemies at all times because they are great friends who want her to still be a vicious person to their enemies. I mean, remember Kentaris. Exactly. That that's how they get her pumped up for missions. They they just have they one of the techs walk up and they're just like, hey, hey, remember Kentaris. And you just see her whole face like turn bright red and she just gets in her mech and goes. <laughs> I mean, murdering Cretans is a is a pastime in the uh in the march. Tis true. It's a time honored pastime. What'd you do today? Killed Karita. That's what she did. <laughs> Speaking of Karina, for our data dive today, we are going to talk once again about House Karina with part four of their history. Disgusting. And just like that, you've lost him. (laughs) My interest, gone. (laughs) Sorry, Brent. Well, well, you could sit in the corner and be quiet then. (laughs) Oh, okay. Okay, bye. When last we talked of House Karina and the Draconis Combine... Robert Carita had returned from signing the Ares Conventions, tempering his ability to invade the Lyran Commonwealth by way of bureaucracy and restrictions of engagement and weapons. It is hotly debated in circles still concerned of this era as to what if Robert Carita had lived longer, for Robert died from an assassin's bullet in December of 2412, the same year the Ares Convention was signed. It is commonly believed by most that the assassin was set in place by Marika Karita, Robert's sister, in revenge for the death of her lover and father of her child. Parker Karita, Robert's younger brother, ascended to the position of coordinator, and for the duration of his reign, he acted essentially as he thought Robert would. 
As Parker was always the subservient of the two brothers, and Robert cast a long shadow even in death. Parker's reign was nine years, and he kept the military footing, applying pressure to the Lyran Commonwealth, and occasionally raiding the Federated Sons, purging disloyal, air quotes, citizens from its population and strengthening and centralizing Cretan control. A brief side note, House Corita has always had a disdain, to put it diplomatically, of members of its family born out of wedlock, while some of it is obviously a conservative leaning of the ruling families and the emphasis on on centralizing money, land, and political power, part is also a lived experience that comes in a one-two punch from 2421 and 2422. In these two years, both branches of House Corito would be overthrown by bastards. <gasps> First, we have Nahongi von Rors, a child born from the union in the stables between Warner von Rors and Marika Corita. Nahongi was raised in secret and specific information was withheld from him. But the human mind is naturally curious, and the adults often underestimate the next generation. As Nahagi grew, he slowly learned his origins, the fate of his father, and the actions of his uncle. While Nahagi wished to do harm to the coordinator, he was denied the chance, but his unspent rage changed targets to his uncle, who was a pale copy of Robert. In 2419, when Saigo Karita died in combat, Nahagi became the next in line for coordinatorship. According to the governmental structure outlined by Shiro Karita, being male was more important than being a bastard to Shiro, apparently. Nahagi had joined the military and had cultivated some connections with units and officers he had served with. In 2421, he secured enough of a footing to act on a dark night in March 2421, a transfer of house guards to military personnel took place, and by morning, Parker Karita was dead, and Nahagi was proclaimed coordinator. There is no doubt that Nahagi was, was a capable politician at court, and his paranoia no doubt helped him survive as long as he did. That being said, there are certain choices he made that were no doubt questionable and the governmental practices that were downright wrong. Nahagi quickly executed most of the other members of the coup, replacing them with yes-men and securing his control of the military. He then exiled all members of House Karita of the new Samarkand branch, instead of executing them. He did also sell his aunt Lenore Karita to a periphery lord as a slave. There she suffered for 15 years before being hunted down for sport. Some of the line did remain in hiding, like Philip Karita, who held out for four years, but eventually all were discovered and forced into exile. Next we have Daniel Sorensen, the child of Oma Karita and Jan Sorensen. He was raised on Rasselhog and cared for by his mother, who, as we mentioned before, never recovered from her time in captivity and turned to alcoholism to cope. Daniel eventually left and joined the local military after his mother's death in an effort to escape his uncle, to learn more of the area of space, and to discover who he was as a person away from court. When Nahagi seized control of the Draconis Combine, Jason Karita supported his actions, going so far as to dispatch troops to support the usurper. This, along with what Daniel had seen in his travels, the oppression, the suffering, and the injustice of Jason's organization, made it impossible for Daniel not to act. His personal hatred and decades of abuse from his uncle, I'm sure, helped in his decision-making process, as it is well noted that Jason only ever referred to Daniel in derogatory terms that will not be repeated here. When Daniel sent out his proclamation that he intended to remove Jason Karita as governor, he was joined and aided by his cousins, Toshiro and Hanoko Karita, the twin sons of Adam Karita. They would give support and add legitimacy to his cause. As Daniel's support and success grew, Jason recalled his troops from Nahagi's command. This resulted in Jason being stripped of his office and accomplishing one of Daniel's goals. When Daniel seized the throne room, he offered Jason exile. Jason refused, instead drawing a concealed pistol. Daniel and his quick reflexes were enough to survive the encounter, but he did have to kill Jason in order to stop him. The matter was ruled self-defense. Daniel took control of the Principality of Rasselhog and proclaimed himself Lord, not Governor. He positioned himself as an advocate for the population, 
and in opposition to Dinahagi, providing safe harbor for the Cretans in exile. Daniel is looked back on as a negative mark for killing his uncle, but the coloring is unfair as many say he did more to support the Cretan family than Jason did. This meant that for the duration of the von Rorst dynasty, the principality of Rasselhog was in a cold rebellion, if you will, not officially recognized as a state any more than it was before, but not paying full respect and taxes to the new Samarkand. Now, with the grip on power secure, Nahagi expanded the purges to a new bloody level, while Robert and Parker's public executions were monthly occurrences. They now became daily under Nahagi's rule. Entire families would be rounded up for a comment made in frustration by a single member. Nahagi started a 89-year rule that would be seen more as an era than as a time of distinct rulers. For Nahagi and his paranoia caused him to become a recluse inside the imperial palace, and his children became even more reclusive, to the point that we are unsure what many of the von Rorschs looked like, and the records are extremely unclear as to when the term of one coordinator's rule started and ended. As best we can tell, Nahagi ruled from 2421 to 2452, Kozo from 2452 to 2470, Yama from 2470 to 2508, and Cougar from 2508 to 2510. The Von Roos dynasty abused power and held control with terror and blood. They kept the pressure up on the Lyran Commonwealth's border, taking worlds when they could, occasionally raiding the Federated Sons for prestige and propaganda, but never at any real threat of things escalating. The advent of the Battlemech happened during the Von Roos dynasty, and they worked hard to steal or secure the technology. Ironically, it was a loyal opposition inside the ISF that was motivated by the constant purges that would secure the Battlemech technology for the Draconis Combine. An ISF agent secured a desk team under false pretenses and raided the Lyran Commonwealth facility on Coventry, securing the missing knowledge for the Draconis Combine. They then quickly retooled to produce the machines, with the early generations of their own machines plagued by technical issues. The run of the Von Roos was a bloody blur of little true note other than the desensitization of what the population endured while they waited for a worthy Cretan heir to return and correct these wrongs they were enduring, as duty demanded. What happened first was the McAllister Rebellion, but that is the subject of our next Draconis Combine data dive. Dun, dun, dun. All I'm saying, at least the Federated Sons uh, wasn't, wasn't this bad. They did have a, a good chunk of bad times where they kind of tanked their economy. <laughs> Yeah, but tanking your economy and, you know, having daily executions. Daily executions is definitely a lot. I mean, but I think there was one prince who uh, who often killed many people that he even put into positions of authority. Ah, uh, yes. That. That's not the point. <laughs> Are you going to break into song, We Don't Talk About Him? <laughs> no. Uh, I no. Mean, no. <laughs> no, I'm tired right. of hearing that stupid meme. We just don't talk about it. We just don't talk about it. Yeah. House Karita has has some very interesting, like, lore in it. Mm-hmm. Like, we talk about how the Capellan Confederation is repressive, but, like, then you look at Karita, and uh, to be fair, the Capellans honestly come out being probably somewhat better people. Yeah. Easily. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah, they, they have their share of, you know, internal purges <laughs> and bad things. But to a certain extent, like, it's a little bit more controlled. Even, like, under, uh, what's her name, Ma or Maximilian and Romano, like, it's not it to be at the higher levels of power, but for the average citizen, I don't think it was that bad, from what I've read. I like, mean, you, yeah. you just had to keep your head down and not have any aspirations. Pretty much. Just, just, <laughs> don't, don't try and get in the, don't try and become powerful. It, it's healthier that way. Much, much healthier. I think if you read the lore of any of the successor states, like, you start to realize that it's like, ooh, like, oof, you had some rough times, didn't you? Yep. <laughs> None of them are good guys. <laughs> nope. There is no white hat. There nope. is no white hat. It's just gray. And mm -hmm. even the ones that people tend to look at and say are like, oh, these people are terrible. Uh, I mean, yes, but 
But I think at the same time, there's definitely some nuance to it of like, well, look at how their state is run. Is does mm-hmm. it work? Or depending on the time period, especially when it comes to hereditary rule. I think Dan Carlin, in a podcast, said it best: is that you're basically rolling on the on the hereditary rule table. Yep. You never know when you're going to get a person insane and a person who's really good at their job. Yeah. It's basically like rolling on the M W M U L. Like, are you going to get a good Mac or are you going to get a bad Mac? We'll see. Find out next week. Yeah. Essentially, now instead of that, it's will you get a uh, will you get a good ruler or will you get a ruler? We'll find out. Mm-hmm. Or is your ruler just going to be utterly insane? Who knows? I certainly don't. Yeah. It makes it fun, doesn't it? That's <laughs> why it's the mercenary life for me. I mean, the mercenary life is probably just as bad, if not worse. Because now you're relying on these people. Yep. I mean, theoretically, you can you can get your own little dropship and maybe one day find a little fiefdom off in the periphery, set up a little, a little base of your own where you're free. Well, Hopefully discover a Star League something, you know. You're free, but what about the people that you're brutally repressing to be your serfs? Who says I'm repressing anybody? Do you not talk about those people here, sir? Yeah, we don't we don't talk about that here. This episode is brought to you by the letter oppression. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I felt like this was the perfect time for a uh, for a product placement, you know. Yeah. Does your cat make too much noise? Try kitten mittens. I said, has your child been talking back? Send them to Cretan Reeducation. They will be most honorable samurai once they're Eight out of ten Davian parents agree. They come back (laughs) knowing all of the correct things. (laughs) No. (laughs) All right. There there is that brief, very brief detente where that would have been a good advertisement. (laughs) Uh, It depends on which march you live in. (laughs) Not the Draconis Combine March. You mean the Draconis March? Yes. Yes. Our sources for today are Sarna, Battletech Battle Mech Manual, Master Unit List, TRO and Record Sheets Succession War, TRO and Record Sheets 3050 Upgrades, TRO and Record Sheets 3085 Cutting Edge, Record Sheets 3145, Recognition Guide Volume 19, Fall Down 7 Times, Get Up 8, Battletech 2018 by Hairbrain Schemes, Handbook House Karita, and Sourcebook House Karita. Yeah, go team. Sometimes you have too many abbreviations. Uh, <laughs> Pretty much. Too much good stuff. This podcast is made possible by our supporters on patreon.com backslash on the origin of battle mechs. Link in the description. Our social media on Twitter is at origin of mechs. We also have a community discord, the armory of Ouroboros. Link in the description. You can email us at on the origin of battle mechs at gmail.com. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on your platform of consumption, tell your friends about us, and share on your community platform of choice. Special thanks to my friend Laura for the intro and outro. Our Ace Pilot Patreons are John Keith III, Metal Ed, and Stahlkater. Class dismissed. Everybody have a great day. Stay safe out there. New Avalon in the new year. Module complete. System standby. Would you like to load the next module? Double kill. Double kill. Killtacular. Killtrocity. Kilimanjaro. <laughs> twenty-eight fifty. Or twenty-eight fifty. Yeah, I don't know why I said twenty-five. In the I'm, year I'm twenty-five twenty-five, if man is still alive. <laughs> Are they still alive? Are they even men at that point? What if they're actually not humans anymore and they just don't realize it? Deep philosophical thought for the episode. There you go. So the five.